Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you. This is Father's, Father's Day, so I hope and pray that you may enjoy this service in Father's true peace. Uh, let us lift our hearts before we pray. Our Father, our Lord, thank you so much for gathering us on this Sunday. Father, at this time we pray that may we find the gratitude that you deserve and thanksgiving that you deserve and praise and honor and glory that you deserve through our lips, through our hearts, through our offerings, and through our lovingly fe uh, sharing fellowships. Father, at this time we pray that may you show your glory upon us through this worship. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ in thanksgiving. Amen. Can we put our hands together. Can we celebrate the joy of the Lord? And his goodness for us. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, 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 I know nothing but the blood of Jesus.
God's word comes alive when we sing it, when we commit scripture to a melody, when we use lyrics in a familiar hymn like this one to proclaim to God our testimony of praise to him. Let's sing together. Come the fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of love and praise. Teach me some melodious song song by Oh 
This morning, he. Good morning, welcome to the Covenant of Torches Sunday service, this special day, Father's Day. So let's go ahead and rise. We we'll go before our Father in silent prayer. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. This time we'll recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, there 
Response reading today is number 98. Honoring your father and your mother. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Amen. Father God, we again thank you for bringing us safely through another week and keeping us safe, Father. As we come into your house today, Father, and where we watch by VOD, Father. Either way, Father, we're receiving this true, true word today, Father. And Father, we ask that you will touch Pastor John as he delivers this message today, Father, and let it ring in our ears, Father, and be received at our hearts, Father. For Father, we know that everything that's going on today, Father, we know it's in your control, Father. We just need to let go, Father, and let you do do your thing, because only you know your plans. And Father, we pray for those that are out there watching by BOD, Father, that you will keep them safe in their homes, Father, until it's safe to come back, Father. And Father, we just ask that you will show us, Father, your ways, not ours. Guide us in your ways, Father. Show us how to be standing at the right place at the right time, Father. And we know that all we can do, Father, is to give you our heart, to give you our love, Father, and put trust in you to do everything for us, Father. In your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading today is coming from Ezekiel 43, 13 through 17. These are the measurements of the altar in cubits. Uh, cubit is one cubit and a hand breadth. The base one cubit high and one cubit wide with a rim around its edge of one span. This is the height of the altar. From the base on the ground to the lower ledge, two cubits. The width of the ledge, one cubit. From the smaller ledge to the larger ledge, four cubits. And the width of the ledge, one cubit. The altar's hearth is four cubits high, with four horns extending upward from the hearth. The altar hearth is 12 cubits long, 12 cubits wide, square at its four corners. The ledge, 14 cubits long and 14 wide on the four sides. With the rim of the half a cubit around its base, one cubit all around, and its steps face toward the east. Amen.
Pastor, come forward and give us the message on Ezekiel's altar was different. Hallelujah. May the truth of God, the glory of God, march on until it marches right into your heart. Amen. Amen. Today is Father's Day. And as we read in our silent reading today, 
our responsive reading, we saw that it was the first promise from God, the first commandment with God that comes with a promise. You know, it's my desire that we could f receive the promises of God. Today, a lot of dads are thinking about themselves and are wondering about what they're going to receive. Brother Church, brother sisters, I pray that you would think about what you could receive from Almighty God this morning. Hallelujah. It's not about you and I. It's really a, for all the things on this earth, marriage, mothers, fathers, everything is all about God. Hallelujah. Today I wanted to share a message with you about the characteristics of Ezekiel's temple and especially the altar of burnt offerings. Even in the Old Testament, a profound message about a temple was given. And we need to see what, it, what the message is, what it really means, and how it's different. How do they relate to Father's Day? You're saying, Pastor John, why are you speaking on Ezekiel's temple? It's Father's Day. Well, it really is Father's Day. But let's see what that consummates and really means. Brother Barry, if I could ask you to turn to the first slide. I want you to see this is the entire principle of the entire message. When we look at Ezekiel's message, whether it be from Ezekiel 1 all the way to the end, we see that it... Everything with Ezekiel from the little scroll all comes with this. He's by a river and he sees the vision of a chariot. You see that? Brother Barry, if you could get someone to get to be the little pointer, I would appreciate it. It begins with a chariot vision. And we see how that foreshadows a pre-incarnation of the word of God. Because Ezekiel's temple is really foretelling the coming of the word of God. We see the chariot vision also points to... A temple vision, which is going to come second and middle, first and foremost in the Word of God. But ultimately, it's telling us how Jesus Christ is the living God, and he is the temple of God. Make sure this is on. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Does everybody see the vision I'm talking about here? If you just could wrap your mind around that for a moment. I want us to see that the vision points to a really a conclusion. This slide does too. The temple, the Bible describes as a cube, and it says the altar is square. Now it's not square at the beginning. It begins broader, like at 16 cubits, 14 cubits, and it'll go on up to ultimately where it gets to the altar, and it's 12 by 12 cubits. These are special cubits. But if we really looked at the, looked at the position of the altar, we would find that the altar in Ezekiel's temple is in the very, very center of the temple of Ezekiel. And like I said, each level of that altar, be it 16, 14, 12, they all get smaller as they go towards heaven. We know Jesus is our way to heaven this morning. Amen? But what I wanted you to see is at the top, it is a perfect square. And we've learned how perfect square means holiness, righteousness. Everything is equal and just these are incredible messages or excuse me incredible special measurements God uses these incredible measurements to describe the temple and also the altar of burnt offerings why is it special because these are special cubits it says a cubit with a hand breadth and what I'd like for you to see this morning this hand breadth represents the hand of our God and Father and Jesus Christ. The hand of God must build the temple. It must be in the measurement of the temple. It must be everything about the temple we're building, too. We are temples of God. Amen? Amen. These special measurements teach us that the temple and the altar of, bear, of burnt offerings are a very important message. Why? Because just like the temple and the altar, it's central, it's important message, so is the message that we find on the altar and how it relates to redemption history. Everything's all about the work of God in redemption history. He's marching on, amen? Whether we march or not, he's marching. Hallelujah. Everything, every part of this temple, it all fits together perfectly. Sometimes contractors get blueprints and they don't fit together quite like the engineer drawn it out. But God is the perfect engineer. Can I get an amen this morning? Everything fits together perfectly like a puzzle. 
The temple is also a picture of the word of God. And we know that the word of God is called a puzzle in a parable oftentimes. But in every word, every piece, everything fits together like a plan. And it's a plan that has a function. It's a plan that has a purpose. It's a temple that has a purpose. It's an altar that has a purpose. This is a four-horned altar. And it's at the top of some stairs. How many stairs were there? We remember there were how many stairs going up to the altar? There were ten. I think about studying the ten steps in our church. And the ten steps to God, we used to say. I believe it's ten steps to Jesus Christ as well. But this four-horned altar at the top of the stairs was located, this four-horned altar, located in the absolute center of the temple. And if we looked at the temple and, and we looked at the altar, if we drew diagonal lines to, as in to form a cross or to find the axis point, we would find that the altar was dead center, absolutely in the middle of the temple. That means it's important, church. We need to understand that. It's the center, the exact point where the temple axis, like a cross, is found. And where is this all? Where is this altar? Inside the inner court. The altar is, is central. Therefore, the message of the altar is central and it's very, very, very important. If you love the Lord, say Amen. Now, I want to talk about this message this morning, and I want to talk about the two kinds of offerings that were really going to be done there in the last days, okay? Two kinds of altars, uh, offerings. The first offering I wanted to speak about today was a blood offering. It was a blood sacrifice, and it was an offering for sin. There, the blood, animal, the blood of the animal was to be sprinkled, not just on the altar, but on the horns of the altar, and it was an atonement for man's sin and man's shame. His nakedness, you might say. The altar was to be sprinkled, but it was on a certain day. You know what day that was? It was on the day called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. And that day came around annually every year. God was practicing teaching Israel something. Yom Kippur represents the day that Jesus would come and die on a cross for you and me. He would shed his blood as atonement for our sins. <clears throat> the second offering I wanted to talk about that would be given there today was a very holy offering. Now, it's hard to be more holy than the blood of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen there? But here, it's called very holy. It's very precious. It's something that God thinks is so divinely good because it's also made by fire on an altar. It's not, it, doesn't, it isn't the blood of the sacrifice, which we know is holy, but it was a sacrifice of grain offering. Grain offering. Wheat. Grain. July the 5th, the church in Seoul is going to celebrate the gift of the first fruits, and the, the day of the first fruits, and uh, everybody's preparing for that in their hearts and minds. But this grain offering, or this holy grain offering, as it's called in my Bible, the priest in their chambers would take it and they would, after it was prepared, it was stored up, they would take it and carry it to the altar and it would be offered there by fire. It was a peace offering. A peace offering. What God wants to do most of all is to have peace with you and I. Peace in his family. Peace in his church. Peace in his kingdom. There'll be no battles, no wars, nothing there. In the future, if you love the Lord, say amen again. What does this fire on that altar represent? Psalms 104 verse 4, Hebrews 1 7 says it is the word of the living God. He makes his work, his ministers, his flames of fire. <coughs> These offerings foreshadow God's future plan and his work with his fire and with the word of God. They foretell of the offering that was to be given to the Father. See, I want you to think about that. This was an offering that was to be given to God the Father. Amen? Not only to be given by Jesus Christ, but it also represents offerings that the priest would give in the kingdom. God doesn't want you to die on a cross anymore, but he wants you to have a cross and believe in a cross. 
He wants you to serve him. But you know, God said, we, we have been, we as priests can give offerings to God in Ezekiel's temple. You know, how do I say that? We're not just priests. Say this with me. I'm not just a priest. I am a royal priest. Royal means divine. Someone with glory. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We're only quoting it. Let's go to our slide, Brother Barry. Jeremiah 3, verse 16 and 17. I want us to read this. Jeremiah foretells this. It says, then. After, after, when, when is then? That's what we need to know. Verse 16. Jeez, huh? Then it shall come to pass... When you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for it shall not come to mind. In other words, they won't even think about the ark. Nor shall they remember it. <coughs> nor shall they visit it. Nor shall it be made anymore. God said, don't try to make an ark just because you can't find it. Verse 17, let's read it. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of God, or throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem is the name of the Lord too. Jesus Christ is our city of peace. He is our Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. We don't need to be following our evil hearts anymore. Amen? And that day we won't. You know, Ezekiel speaks of both offerings that I've talked about this morning in his message of the temple. Just write these down. Ezekiel 37 verse 19 and Ezekiel 43 verse 7. They talk about these offerings. Ezekiel's temple speaks, about a, mes speaks a message about the day of God's arkless temple. There will be no ark there, Jeremiah said. And Ezekiel speaks about it too. Not only will this be a day of atonement that we think about, because the blood sacrifice is an atonement for our sins, but it's also a, de a de time and a day of the coming of the Son of Man, marching on in His glorious coming. One day we're going to live in the presence of the Almighty God. If you love Jesus, say amen. Ezekiel's detailed description of that vision that he saw, he saw the temple. He saw the precious altar. Chapter 43 records that message. All of chapter 43. But even the, the vision of Ezekiel that he receives comes in the middle of the temple vision. It comes in the middle. Why is everything in the middle? The center. The axis. Beloved church, the temples and altars that were all built before, maybe the temples you're building today, I hope that you're building them correctly, were all built with a plan. They were either built by man's plan like Herod's or God's. But you know what? None of these was, would be complete. None of those would be as special as the temple of Ezekiel and the city of God. None of them would be because they only reveal a part of God's plan. We need all of God's word. Amen? They were all pointing to another special day, a day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel's temple is a picture of the coming of Jesus Christ. And we knew the Lord has to come again. The work and the offering that was going to be made there was going to be manifest not by man, but by God. God would make the offering. Where? In Ezekiel's temple. And that temple points to Jesus Christ. The offering was made in Christ. And it was made on the cross. On the Shipjaga, the cross. Jesus was the sacrifice offering that was going to be made once and for all, for all time, for all mankind that would believe and receive it. <clears throat> yes, Jesus made the blood sacrifice. How many believe the cross was a divine offering? Why is the cross a divine offering? Because it was made by a divine one, Jesus Christ himself. But who did Jesus make this sacrifice for? For you and me, yes. But he knew the sacrifice his father needed to make. Can I get another amen? 
You know, when Abraham was told to take his son and go to a mountain, Abraham knew he had to make an offering. God said, make that offering. See, this is how Abraham would become the father of faith. Now, Isaac went with him. He obediently went with him. He lovingly went with him. He loved his father. He had faith like his father. But he got there and he said, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, you're the sacrifice. And Isaac would give his life. Lay it down for his father. Now, look. Isaac carried wood, but Jesus Christ carried a cross. Isaac was spared. He was delivered. God said, stop. I know you believe in me now. Amen, church? There was no time did God ever tell Jesus Christ, stop. Jesus knew it was the Father's day. What do you mean, Pastor John, it was the Father's day? Jesus said, this is the day I'm going to honor my Father. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to bring honor to my father. I'm not going to shame my father. Too many men in this world have brought shame. They call themselves Christians even, and yet they have brought shame upon God's church. They haven't got received promises of God. Perhaps it's because they brought shame instead of glory. Today, I pray that all of us who know that the death of Jesus Christ on a cross could receive blessings and the promises of God. Jesus knew what Father's Day was. Do you? Do you know what it really means? Jesus' cross was the center of God's work. It was not the end of God's work, but it was the center. It was the middle that means there, it's the access point, and yet there's still a work to be done by our Father at the second coming. Some today would call the cross, the cross, church, just like our belly button. They call it the navel or the belly button of the earth. The belly button is a center. We receive life from our mother through an umbilical tube until it's severed and we live on our own. Others call the cross the crossroads, the axis, the perfect center of God's work. It wasn't the end, it was in the middle. But it was the center of God's work. The whole message of Ezekiel's temple, the whole message of these offerings, these burnt offerings, they serve to teach us something. They want to teach us something about the whole work of God, our Father, and Jesus Christ at the end. It reveals the last work of God to be done also. And these are all marked, we learned last Wednesday and the Wednesday before. They're marked by signs are in Hebrew called ut. These signs are all revealed in the revelation. We see them, but we don't sometimes don't understand them, just like people don't understand Ezekiel's temple. But they're also revealed in what God calls the little book. How many know about the little book? You believe there is a little book. These are all seen in the last trumpets of God. And all these sounds, as these trumpets are sounding, the final work of recreation, the final work of complete restoration is taking place. I pray that it's taking place in your life today and in your home. The word of God says, then when that work is done, there will be no more tears. Revelation 24 said, there'll be no tears, no blood, no death, no dying. That's so profound. How can that be? This means there'll be no more food, no more blood offerings or the shedding of blood. No, no more dying because all will be restored. That's going to be after judgment, church. Let's look at our next slide there, brother. Colossians 1.20, let's read together. Begin. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. See, the cross gives you peace. He was making peace with the Father because we weren't making peace with God at all. We were at enmity with God in the flesh. 
The New Testament reminds us about the shame that Jesus publicly shared and endured on his father's altar. Did you know that was his father's altar? He was God's son as it came in the name of Jesus Christ. He was God's word. He, we would learn he would be the temple of God, yet that was God's altar. T Jesus is that perfect temple. Can I get an amen? His cross became an altar of shame. To who? To Israel. Why? They were looking at him with fleshly eyes, natural eyes. They falsely accused him, and the Bible says he bore our curse, and he was hanged on a tree according to the law. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23 say, anyone who, who shamed his father would be hung on a curse, hung on a tree. It tells us when it would be taken down. He became a curse for our sins, Galatians 3, 13. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. In the time of Ezekiel, God said, Hey, Ezekiel, I've shown you the vision. I've given you the little scroll. I want you to reveal my plan to my people, but only to those who are ashamed. They called Jesus a shame. They called him a bad son, but Jesus was a good son. He loved his father, and he knew what Father's Day was all about. Hallelujah in the house of God. The problem was, in Jesus' day, Israel was not ashamed, just like they weren't in Ezekiel's day. I want you to remember, church, that God gave Ezekiel the word in the form of a vision and in a little scroll. That foreshadows the cross. All of these things foreshadow the work of the word at the end. I pray that we could be those who feel ashamed before God. Do you have reason to be ashamed before God today? You say you believed in Jesus Christ, but are you ashamed of what you've done or what you should have done and you haven't done? I pray that you could repent and receive God's true plan, his last word. Where is that written at? The Bible tells us. Jesus' altar was, was the cross. He was the sacrifice that was made for our reconciliation. Let's look at the next verse here. <clears throat> Let's read together, church. Shi Psalms 118, verse 27. Begin. God is the Lord. And he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. That's how Jesus was bound. It foreshadows the binding of Jesus Christ. Not with cords only, but with nails. He was bound to the horns of God's altar. He knew what his father needed and he did it. We claim we know our Father, but are we doing what our Father needs us to be doing right now? If we do, aren't, we should be ashamed. If I gave my son for you, I would, Dad, burn it. I would expect you to do something in return saying, thank you, Pastor John. We need to tell our Father this morning, thank you, God. Ezekiel's temple, his altar, represent the gift of God's deep word, his light. And it reveals the love that our Father has for us. Jesus' love was not unconditional, nor is our Father's. Unconditional. So the significance of the temple we can find in the message of the four horns. Why four horns? Why three levels on the altar? Why is one larger, small, medium, and then small? Why is one square and the others aren't? These horns... And on this altar, they foreshadow the place where Jesus' blood would drop from his hands and from his feet. Do you understand what I've just said? His hands and his feet were the, represent the horns of the temple of God's altar. The blood would trickle down from the horn, the horns, just like the water of Ezekiel's temple. It would go on down from the, from the horns down to the second floor. That represents you and me. We're next to Christ. But it would go on down from there. That's why I had a trough at the bottom. A trough that the, none of the blood of Jesus Christ would be spilled for nothing. We ought to be ashamed, church. 
Every precious blood of Jesus Christ is precious. Every word of God is precious. The cross is precious. The temple of God is precious. Hallelujah. Our Father gave us life just like our mom and dad give us life. So Ezekiel's temple, the altar represents our Father's spiritual altar. Abraham, Isaac knew Abraham needed an offering. Jesus knew his father. And he said, I love my father's commands. I always seek to do my father's will. This foreshadows the life that we are to live for God too at the end. Did you know that? The Bible says, walk as Jesus also walked. March as he marched. Then the truth of God shall march on. Jesus Christ sacrifice, that sacrifice, what did it do for you and me? It became a grain offering and a peace offering that we needed. He gave the offering of blood for our sins, but he also later says that he was the grain offering. Jesus Christ sacrificed and he opened the way for Christian priests like you and me, royal priests, to rise up, stand up, and to serve God. Look at your neighbor and say, let's serve God this morning. Jesus' sacrifice enables people like you and me to become believing priests. Not priests that are kata. Not hypocrites, but real priests. Those who are chosen, those who have received a God-given right, a God-given call to come to him, to enter his temple, and to do our priestly duties in our chambers. You're blessed to be, in or to be able to enter into Ezekiel's temple and the inner courts. You're blessed to have a chamber there. Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 6, and chapter 10 all speak about this work too in the New Testament. Listen, church, let me ask you a question. Why is the inner court so important? Why is it the fact we have a chamber is so important? Why is this so important? Why is the little scroll in Ezekiel why is the little book in Revelation so important? Because after the, receiving the little book, taking it out of the hand of the angel of God, God, John was told to take and eat it, just like Ezekiel was. But in Revelation 11, verse 2, never forget this verse till you go to heaven. Revelation 11, 2, John said, I received a rod from God. And I was told to measure the temple in its inner courts, but I was told to leave outside those of the outer courts because they're going to just trample the temple of God even to the very end. Those shall never enter into the end. They'll never be on the inside. If the word of the temple and Christ are nothing. He's told to leave out the outer court. Those who trample the courts, a lot of people would trample the courts even during Jesus' day. Some people will never be ashamed, church. Let me say this. We know this as parents. Sometimes our children honor us. They, they try to be good in society. But some children are never ashamed. They're never ashamed, church. Mom, little Sarayo, they live the way they want to live. They don't do anything to honor you or God. I see that in the church. Some people just will never do anything to honor their father. Some people are never ashamed. They'll never want to do anything for, for our father or for Jesus Christ. How many of you want to serve Jesus Christ this morning? It's Father's Day. You need a gift. You need to be able to give something to Jesus and to your father. Hallelujah. Why? It's the plan of God. We're priests. We can enter Ezekiel's temple. We can enter his holy city. But you know what does that all mean? It means we can get deep in the word of God. We can get close in a relationship with God. We can get deeper and deeper in the word. And in our relationship with God, we can have an intimate relationship with not only the Lamb, but with our Father in his kingdom. The Bible says one day he's going to dwell in our midst. If you can accept that, swallow it, need it. This is what the Father's Day is all about. It's all about coming to love and worship God. 
Coming to love the Father, coming to love His Son, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something, church. Are you a priest? Are you, do you believe you're a royal priest? If you believe you are, you're supposed to serve God. Serve God. Even like a waitress. Jesus served like a waitress. This is the love. This is what love and worship is all about. If you love God, you'll serve him. If you love God, you'll worship him. If you love God, you'll adore him. If you love God, you'll say, thank you, Father. What does Father want? What does our Father, what do I want as a father? A pair of socks? A necktie or something? No, I want my children to love me. And what does, what does our God and Father want? He wants his children to love him. To dwell at peace in his church, in his kingdom, in his land. That's the kind of children he wants in his house. And he's going to give those children his promises. I believe it's time that we begin, whether we serve him at church, whether we serve him at home, whether we're doing it in our community, let us serve so we can manifest the glory of our Father through our life of prayer, through our life of praise. Don't just praise God at church. Praise him at home too. Big number five. <laughs> I believe it's time for us to stand up and take our rightful place as royal priest. Let us begin to fervently believe. Let us begin to willingly serve God. Not as a commandment. But serve him because we love him. <coughs> serve like we're heirs of the things of heaven. Like you're going to get an inheritance. I seen in Korea years ago, even today you see it. If a, if a dad, if a father has a lot of money, it's all of his kids love him. They want to hang around and say, oh, I love daddy. They want to just love him to death. But if daddy ain't got no money, he ain't got no power. My father has all the power in the world. Hallelujah. Knowing this, I pray that we might receive and believe in the spiritual power of God's forgiveness and his resurrection. Romans 8, 32 and Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. I know you can't get it, but you can watch it. The description of the definition of the altar of burnt offerings is found in Ezekiel 43, verses 13 through 7. We're not going to read that. We did when we opened the service, but I want us to watch a video clip right now. I want you to see this. Please be blessed. This is copyrighted, so be careful. This is no, I, the video clip, brother. There. You see the temple, the outer courts, the inner courts? But there you're going to see the altar. One cubit wide. Here's the lower base. And half cubit for its border. And the gutter is half cubit as well. There's always a place to catch the blood. So the blood would the lower ledge. As well. Two cubits high. Add these up. Two. And adding one cubit for its rim, therefore it's 16 cubits wide. Second level, a smaller ledge is Azura also, four cubits high. Also one cubit around it. And it is 14 cubits long and 14 cubits wide. The top level is Ariel, which is the hearth, four cubits high. It's 12 cubits by 12 cubits. And it's four horns of the altar. What I'd like for you to get a picture of when you look at Ezekiel's temple, look at the center of that, look at the center of that altar. Where would be the access point? If you, if you drew diagonal lines across Ezekiel's temple courts, you would find out it is dead center. It's the living center, if you want to put it that way. 
Remember, there's two offerings. The first was blood, but the second offering was to be an offering of peace. Grain offering. Now we can look at the next slide, brother. Here we see a picture of how the blood was to be poured, sprinkled on these four horns. These four horns have a meaning, by the way, and it would trickle down and, and, and cover here. Ultimately, you see the trough down here where it would any, nothing was ever wasted. God, our Father, made sure the blood of Jesus Christ was never wasted. When the sacrifice was made, the blood would flow down to the middle and second floor and then on down to the base, trickling down. The second floor was located <coughs> right below the top order. It was 14 by 14 cubits. Beloved church, when you're thinking about Ezekiel's temple, think about yours. Think about our fathers. Think about Jesus Christ's temples. Revelation tells us they are the temple of God and we are temples, Paul said. The Bible says everything is about the heart. How's your heart with God today? How's your heart with your literal father? What would you do if he were here? What would you do if our father was here this morning? The third floor represents the very heart of our father and God. It represents the heart of Jesus Christ too. It wasn't Jesus' altar, it was the father's. It was Jesus obeying the Father that gave that offering. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, and he knew that. Let's look at our next slide, Ezekiel 43, 20. Let's read that. You shall take some of the blood and put it on the four horns of the altar and on the four corners of the ledge and on the, four, the rim around it. Thus you shall cleanse it and make atonement for it. See, the blood was an atonement. So what is the usefulness of this temple? The word used here for cleanse, okay, to make clean, is kata. It means to purify from any uncleanness. You know what, it, what sin is, uncleanness is? What shame really is? What we should be ashamed of this morning? The shame of, and sin of failing to achieve the goal and walk that God has called us to make in our life. God has a march. God has a path. He has a plan. We're marching for a lot of things. Let's march for Christ. Amen? Paul said God has a plan for us. Paul said it's our rightful duty to do that. It's our spiritual service to do that. How many want to do spiritual service before? Do that. Serve God. Believe you're a royal priest. Jesus fulfilled his goal and he walked his path. Just like the father laid it out. He didn't argue with the father about it. He prayed. I pray that we can attain the goal that our path and path our father has planned for us as royal priests too. When the blood was applied to the horns, it meant that, the most, that most of the blood flowed down to the second levels and the lower levels. What's the message of the horns, church? The Bible teaches us, listen carefully, it's not in a lot of verses, so... Catch this. The horn. What is the meaning of those horns? In the Old Testament, if someone ran into the temple and they grabbed hold of the horns of the altar, the Bible said they would be give, given amnesty. They would be forgiven. Why? Holding on to the horns. Grabbing hold of the horns means they had repented. They were sorry. They were ashamed of what they had done. So they would live. Beloved church, what does this mean? In John 5, 24, Jesus said, If you believe in me and you, that I am who I, I say I am, you will never die. Jesus wanted us to grab hold of the horns of the cross. No, grab hold of the horns of God, the word of God, the realm of God. 1 Kings Chapter 1, verse 50 through 53 tells us how another man grabbed hold of the horns in an act of repentance. And, he, and when he did so, the Bible said he did not die. How many of you want to live? Grab hold of the horns of God. Why would God focus on the blood and the horns and the blood dripping down and covering the second level? 
Because this is the way the blood flowed down like pitch over Jesus Christ. The blood was like a pitch. It poured down Jesus' body and God wants it to spiritually flow down yours and mine today. Let me ask you a question. Has the blood flowed down on you? Has the blood flowed down on you? Remember that third level, that altar was 12 cubits by 12 cubits. The second level was 14 by 14. What does that mean? 14 is the composition of the number 7, right? 7 plus 7. This means that the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ will perfectly cleanse you and me, but our head, our body, our soul, everything. You know what I pray and what God wants for us to do? He says, I pray your head, your heart would become like Jesus Christ. You want to have the image of Christ, God? That's it. Listen carefully. I'm preparing to conclude here. There is no sin that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot atone for. No sin. Ephesians 1, 7 and 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. So, <clears throat> I want to cut to the chase here and conclude the message. What is God, what is all this work all about? Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Let's go to that slide, brother. You have to skip a couple there. There we go. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. This was the work that man had done, so Jesus Christ did it. Let's read together. Begin. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. If you, wanna, if you don't return your heart to your father, to God your father, to his son Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you do to your earthly dad. If you want to receive the promises of God, return your heart, change your heart, and go back to have a real Father's Day in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Today's Father's Day, I pray that we would give our hearts. Why? Every one of us are giving gifts to our Father, I guess. You know what God wants from us? He wants the gift of love. He wants the gift of peace. He wants the gift of a relationship, a real relationship, just like any daddy wants with his children. God says, give me your heart. That's what I want. It isn't what you can buy. It's what you give. Give him all your heart, not part of it. The last offering that's going to be given us, the offering our father's waiting, is love offerings, thanks offering, peace offerings. Share the green that Jesus shared with you. Let's look at one last passage. 1 John 4.10. Let's read this and be, we'll conclude. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to become the perpetuation of our sins. May we honor our father. This is Father's Day. We have something to give him. We need to serve him. But God doesn't want you giving something or serving something or singing something or, or praising something like a false priest. Be a royal priest. Be a real child of God. When you sing, sing. God knows if you love him when you're singing it. A father knows if you love him when you give him something. So does God, even more so. The cross is a vertical relationship. The axis is in the center. The horns were his feet and his hands, his blood, because he wanted to give us his word. We ought to be ashamed. Israel should have been ashamed that they could not receive his word, know his will, and serve him. How many from now on say, I'm going to have a real Father's Day from now on. I'm going to serve my eternal father. Maybe your earthly father hadn't been no good to you, but God is eternally good. Amen? The cross is the axis, the belly button, the navel. Vertical relationship with our Father. Horizontal relationship in your family, in the church, in your neighborhood, in this nation. It's time this nation become one. Not by arguing with each other, not by politics, but by the blood and the grain and the love 
of Jesus Christ. May we all share God's love with each other. Let us have peace with each other and peace with God. That is the love offering. That is the service that God wants us to give him this morning. Give him your heart. Let's pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I pray that today this message would awaken us again to the real meaning of honoring our Father. Father, we confess that until now, sometimes we haven't even loved our earthly fathers. Father, sometimes we haven't even brought in honor to them or to our mom or dad. But Father God, we're ashamed now. We're ashamed that we have not received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Father God, send down your blood. Send down your light. Send down your rain. Put the pitch around our hearts and our bodies and our lives. Seal us, Father, like you sealed the ark of Noah. And all God's children said, Amen. Hymn number 393. We're ready to sing that. Am I going to have help this morning or am I doing this solo? With all your heart, church, let him know you love him. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. There is no shadow of turning with Thou changest not the compact they fill not. As thou hast been the forever. He never changes. Great is thy peace, great is thy peace, morning by morning, to mercy I speak. All I have needed, thy hands have provided, great is thy peace. Father did give all that we needed. He's brought the hand of Jesus Christ. Father, on this special day, we need to remember that you're our Father. 
you've given us all, Father. There's no way that we could ever repay for all the, the things that you've given us, the blessings you've given our lives, Father. But, Father, now we give our tithes and offerings to you, Father. We do it out of love, Father, for we truly love you and your precious word. And, Father, we just ask that you will continue to bless each and every one of us as we go forward. Keep us safe, Father, so we can come back, Father, and worship again and again, Father, in your name. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we've come, we worship you, Lord. Father is Father's Day, and we remember your Son and his gift, Jesus Christ. Father God, we've all come and we've desired to worship you, but sometimes we haven't known how. Father God, through these gifts, through these tithes, through these offerings, through these peace offerings, whatever the offering is, Father, we give them as an emblem, a symbol of our love for you, Father. We thank you that you are so faithful and loving to us. New mercies we're seeing every day, Lord. And Father God, today, beyond these gifts, beyond these offerings, we want to give you, Father, this day, the gift of our heart. Father God, receive our prayer. Receive our praise. Receive our gifts. Bless those gifts. Bless this day. Bless us, Father. By the power of your word, your forgiveness, and your holy anointing, we ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved church, it's time for us now to share our announcements with each other. Uh, first, I just want to say happy Father's Day to everyone. You know, I've talked about being ashamed. I've been ashamed of a lot of things in my life. Maybe you have been too. If I look back on my life, there's a lot I could be ashamed of. But you know, as a pastor, I'm more ashamed today that I have a, haven't accomplished more for my father than I have. As a minister, I'm telling you, I'm ashamed. I, I would desire that you would have a closer, even more powerful, closer, intimate relationship with God and the Word of God. If we're ashamed, God's going to give us His last word, that's for sure. He'll show us His plan, that's His promise. But he won't show it to you if he doesn't believe that you're going to obey it and keep it. It's Father's Day. If we're not ashamed, let us be ashamed. If, we're not, if we haven't honored him before, let us honor him today and from now on every day. For every day can be his day and ours. Amen? Even for eternity. Let's rise, let's sing hymn number two, and we'll conclude our service with a benediction. Happy Father's Day. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, at God we be glory and the Father is and shall be Let us pray. Let us receive. May the love, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of our God and Father, the fellowship of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit and Word, Father, that gives us understanding, that gives us love, that helps us adore you, Father, that helps us love you, Lord, more. Draw us into a closer relationship with you. May this be our blessings today, for now, forever and evermore. Amen.